Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, my illustrious, wonderful family. Welcome, welcome, welcome to The Mental House with me, your host, Khadija. Uh, this video is not going to be so long, family. This video is to just for a minute reflect on how miserable and how insane we've become as a country to the point where because we won't address the first original sin, the biggest stain on America, and there's no way that the powers that be in America has even attempted to, well, I could say, well, maybe, um, maybe Lyndon Johnson attempted to rectify some of the wrongs that were done, and he had the language. But what I have come to believe now is that we are perpetually miserable. Um, because of the programming, because of Willie Lynch, because of all of the dynamics that went into breaking us, that went to enslaving us um, as a captured group, people who all of a sudden became black or become Negro, when at once they cohabitated on the land um, and that, that they dominated and ruled. But because the situation has never been addressed, and most of us know that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And there has never been an end to this. And what has happened is, in my opinion, it has made black people, uh, descendants of slaves, perpetually miserable. Just like Willie Lynch predicted. There is no way in the world that I guess we have survived physically the trauma. Our bodies are still here. But I think the pain and the madness, um, the betrayal, the abuse, and the Stockholm Syndrome, it has, has it's so great that just as Willie said, we will be perpetually miserable. You don't even have to worry about this. If you implant this stuff on these people right now, they will be forever, ever miserable. When I look at us argue, looking at the, uh, even, I'm going to start with the situation on the border. We have people saying, oh, and they're separating the mothers from the children and the children, but you sold mothers away from their babies. This is no new behavior for the European. This is what the European does. What more do you need to understand when you just see what you're dealing with? After all this time, over 400 years, you still haven't gotten who your open enemy is? Your babies were sold. Your babies was ripped apart from you. And so, and nobody has ever made amends to us for that. Just, you know, and so, you know, and I'm saying that to say, um, for my white listeners, if they get it, they get it. If they stand for truth, they understand. If they don't, they was never an ally in the first place. But what we should know is this. Anytime you have Nazis, I mean, have Jewish people recovering and uh, still uh, having Nazi soldiers hunted down and prosecuted for their roles in Auschwitz and all these other uh, concentration camps, they can actually still be hunted down but your Holocaust means nothing to this society because, again, we are perpetual hosts to a proverbial parasite. When Jane Elliott, my adopted mother from another color, asked the white folks in the room did they think that they were treating us bad, and they said yes, they knew. On a conscious level, on a subconscious level, they know that what has happened to uh, the American descendants of slaves is wrong. If, if, if they just have any, any semblance of intelligence, what has happened to us 
over the course of being here is Rome. And the only time that we've been dogged out and had dogs sicked on us in water holes is when we've tried to, um, say, push back from the treatment. Not because we were violent people, but because we wanted to push back, say, look, enough is enough. You push me to the pressure point. And when you do that, then you begin to tap into the white fragility and then they're sick their dogs on you, sick the National Guard and all that. So I'm saying all this to say, when you're a conquered people and you have, you so crazy, my people are so crazy that you can have a group like in Cobra who was around since I was a teenager and they never did anything other than talk and have meetings and intellectually masturbate. That's all we've ever done. I've had set in you know, plenty of in Cobra meetings. I mean, this I know people that work in in Cobra. Um, I work with the American Holocaust Society, um, Black Holocaust Society. Let's get it. Don't get it twisted. My point is this: everything has to come along, and it's about timing. And everything needs new life breathed into it. H.R. 40 has been sitting in Congress for probably about 20 years, 15 years, at least 10. No one has ever moved on it. And it's so raggedy if you ever read it. It's so vague. And that was their treat to say, oh, we're doing something. We enacted, we, we, we wrote this bill called H.R. 40 and we put it through, con well, we waiting on Congress to do something. 20, 30 years ago. Now you have a group of young uh, Generation Xers coming along. And I must admit, I will be the first one to say it. I had problems with Yvette Carnell because I didn't like her, um, in my opinion, disrespect of baby boys. And I let her know that in no uncertain terms. However, I can't deny the message. I can't be so stupid and egregious. That's just my personal feeling about what she said about a group that I'm just at the very end of. Okay? I'm at the very end of. Because to be honest with you, I'm at the very last year of what they call a baby boom. My take on that was I thought that she was being disrespectful. However, there was a window of time that people in my generation were subjected to that that time has passed and it won't happen again. Things like the League of Martin, things like, um, uh, and I know because my brother and they were part of it to make sure there were enough black officers on these fire departments and on these police departments. And there was a concerted effort to make sure that these numbers, you know, matched or at least were elevated. We had Chief Arthur Jones. We had um, people that were there that were that was actually knowing when you would call one black officer up, put him on a call, the, the other officers, no matter what, they'd come from where they were at to find out if you were okay. Because it was at a time that they were integrating the department in, in departments that weren't usually occupied by black people. And so the you know, of course, the status quo was having a problem with that. So all this time has passed. That window has passed. That's why you have black police chiefs and you had your black um, fire department um, battalions and things of that nature. But what happened was that window has passed now. We're beginning to retire, the baby boys, and those of us who were on the end of those jobs. Now that stuff is closed up. Hell, in my city, alone. The, there's a freeze on city jobs. And, and so what that does, what that says is we're not even hiring no more uh, uh, citizens to even work in government. And that freeze has probably been on implemented uh, maybe for the last at least eight, nine years. So with that being said is when you look at somebody that that would object to their own reparation 
And I think when they hear reparations, they don't hear the word repair. Um, the first thing they think of is, okay, well, I'm going to get some money. You know, even though reparations can take all kinds of forms, you know, and it should. Um, it should it should take many forms. It should take forms in terms of free education. Uh, how? No taxes. What are you going to do to right this wrong? What are you going to do to make us whole? We have never been whole. And it would seem to me that those of us who are older, who work with in Cobras and the Holocaust, the Black Holocaust societies, would understand that our window was passed with that those groups. Those groups wasn't able to breathe life into the community. They wasn't able to bring no life and breathe any into the young people. So now you have ADOS. And instead of you know, people getting on board with that, even in Cobra and the people that supported the HR 40, what we see is a bunch of people who are in ego. They've eased God out. They've eased out the whole um, idea that this is for all of us. And because their name is not on the the, the, the foundation or the founders, and then they refuse to get on it. So as opposed to having a mighty fist that can strike a mighty blow, you got a bunch of scattered people fighting with one another because they're saying, well, my group was better than your group. And even though my group didn't do nothing for the last 20 years, we still feel like we don't we want to represent for that group and we don't want to be bothered with the ADOS. Cutting off your nose to spite your face. What shows me is that we're so damaged that that doesn't mean that you got to continue to not help one another. But what it tells me is you need to worry about the man in the mirror because the ones that get it, get it. A lot of them don't. And they are going, they are a problem. They have been, they've been sambled out. There are people that have been um, compromised through money, and now they got a lifestyle that they're not willing to give up for your uh, Negro self. And the, we, we're going to have to be able to swallow that pill. So when you see us and we're even fighting one another about whether who should the reparations be in the name of, although you have <laughs> Jewish people every day getting their money and wanting more because they respect their heritage and they respect their uh, their basic they just respect their holocaust and their suffrage we on the other hand hate ourselves and we've been trained by the best hater on the planet and unfortunately it has worked so well that there is no way in the world you can even identify your enemy. Well, you might can identify him, but he's so all the way encompassing your reality that what can you do about it? You know, just like I was having a conversation with someone not a couple of days ago, and they were explaining to me how the gatekeepers use me. Um, and, I, and I was kind of upset. And I'm going to share this with y'all because it's really important. I told y'all about I got arrested in 2007 working on a campaign with Mike McGee and you know, Mike Jr. And um, you know, he was doing a few things that I thought was kind of brash. But okay, well, he, he's a few years younger than me. And, you know, young people do stuff a little different. But I saw his heart. And in his heart... Um, he was doing some things that were pretty positive in the community. You know, and I don't want to go into the things, but those are the things that made me want to support him. And those are the things that make me still want to support him. But I told you that he introduced me to a person that was a community organizer. This community organizer had been in jail, charged with bank robbery. I didn't know that. I don't, I don't even think he knew that. But he ended up getting caught up with us in a campaign, and he ended up being an informant. Okay? And actually, I'm going to tell this story, and it's going to spring back into the last, the, the super the final story I'm going to do about Nipsey Hussle. But let me just state this. So he was an informant. This guy was 
a bank robber. All of a sudden, the cops, the fed, they let him out. The feds let him out to um, infiltrate this campaign. Now, um, now the woman told me, she said, oh, you know, this is a family of political people. And, you know, they just using you for um, a fall person. And I kind of got a little upset. And I was like, hey, she's like, oh, they're going to be the one that's in trouble. And that kind of hurt me. You know, kind of made me think, like, what? This is the lady that's down at the, the jailhouse. And I'm saying, you know, is she saying that because, you know, of who our, this campaign represents? Or should I just let me be objective and hear for what, how she's saying this? And that's what I did. So that always stuck in my mind, even when I was defending Mike McGee. It stuck in my mind that his he was part of the gatekeepers. Okay? Now, he's gotten out of jail, and it's amazing to me. I'm not saying that he's an a informant or anything, but he's out of jail. And right away when he got out of jail, he was able to open up CBD stores. That means somebody is connected in the city. Somebody is helping him. Somebody is a gatekeeper. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, I'm saying it, and I'm saying it boldly. Somebody is a gatekeeper. So he don't want to have a conversation about that. So I don't know why I was arrested. All I know is sometimes you have to be mighty, mighty careful who you even back. And as black people, we want to be free so bad. We want to get this noose from arbitrage from around our neck so bad that sometimes we make wrong decisions and we follow wrong leadership. So all I want to do is encourage y'all today to look at yourself. See if you are perpetually miserable. And if you are, has slavery damaged you that bad? Are you in such ego that you will... Cut off your own nose to spite your face. And because reparations don't look like it's coming from in Cobra or it's coming from R RGB or whoever, if it's not coming from the red, black, and green, or if it's not coming from the NAACP, if it's not coming from that, and this is your gauge and this is your scope, your standard, then you already know what the outcome is. Because you're still dealing with the same group of people, whether it's 1600 or whether it's 2019, that will separate children from their parents. No different. The only difference is there was money exchanged 400 years ago. Now they're just probably taking a few of those kids, allegedly, and just sending them into foster care. Keep the foster care system going from children that you've stolen, like you've stolen uh, or on the black market for adoption, just like that, what happened at Katrina. Still stolen uh, people's kids. And you have women that are insane right now and can't recover from the fact that they handed their baby to somebody and then the door shut and they drove off with those people's kids. When the missionaries were saying, give us your kids, let's, let's get the kids in here first. Let's get the kids in her first. And any mother think that their baby is going to be saved right now. They're going to give you the baby so they can step on the bus. It was a sham. And those kids were never seen again. So all I'm saying that is, I'm saying that to say, you, we might be too damaged. We might be too damaged to have any form of, a freedom. I don't know. Let me know what y'all think. Let me know what you think about it. Because from where I sit, it's pretty bad. All right. Like what you hear. Please like, subscribe, and share. And I'll see you in the next video.